Let's try to start with a little riddle. What do you think it is? Seriously. Try to guess in the comments what this actually is. Or, here's a slightly closer shot. And then we'll see how many of you guessed correctly, or at least we're close. In the meantime, imagine that you want to see something very small, which would be impossible to see even if you look closely. Or maybe you just want to see the smallest details of something. In that case, this is what you'll do. The first thing that comes to mind is to use a magnifying glass or a microscope right away. But what if you want to consider the very structure of something, for example, to see a transistor in a processor? What will you do? Just switch the microscope to a lens with a larger magnification? Will it work? Today, we will cover a lot of interesting things. Look at a real electron microscope and find out why it's needed at all. We will also figure out how to increase something by hundreds of thousands of times with the help of electrons and tell you how science learned to see a single atom. Everything is as you like, detailed and clear and also something extraordinary. Today, we will look at the Droider through an electron microscope, and it's not clickbait. Hello everyone, it's Droider. Let's go and figure it out. Surely, one of you as a child, following the example of Sherlock Holmes, looked at everything around with a magnifying glass. After all, it's so cool to see something magnified. It feels like a completely new, unexplored little world is opening up. So, pretty much, the optical microscope works according to the principle of an ordinary lens. Of course, this device is much more complicated. A microscope is a combination of lenses with detailed optical parameters that are assembled in the proper order. However, the principle of operation remains the same. Light in the visible wavelength range either passes through the object or is reflected from the surface and passing through a system of magnifying and focusing lenses going first into the the eyepiece and then into our eye. Modern optical microscopes are really massive and complex devices consisting of dozens of different lenses and mirrors, which are assembled in a special order to give a person the opportunity to look at different types of objects and with different magnifications. And the lenses are different, from lenses with two or three times magnification to really huge lenses with the ability to magnify objects a hundred times. Just look at the cutout of the lens from the Zeiss company with a 50-fold magnification. With the proper combination and the right eyepiece, you can achieve a magnification of even 2,000 times. And here, it's worth asking the question, what are the problems then when, after all, you can endlessly bend lenses and create complex systems that will magnify tens of thousands of times, allowing you to see the tiniest details of anything? But as usual, it's not so easy, and this is due to the physical limitations of visible light. After all, visible light is a wave with a certain length, and an optical microscope uses its optical spectrum from about 800 to 400 nanometers. And physics, the heartless bastard, does not allow us to distinguish objects that are less than about half the wavelength. That is, with the help of a conventional optical microscope, we will not be able to distinguish anything that is less than 200 nanometers. So, this restriction was named after the German scientist Ernest Abbe, which is called the Abbe diffraction limit. And it allows you to get the minimum resolution value not only for visible light, but also for any other electromagnetic wave. If you remember, light is also an electromagnetic wave. Our loyal subscribers will recall that we showed you the same formula in the video about extreme ultraviolet lithography, when we talked about limiting the resolution for deep ultraviolet. So you see, it's the same here. Modern microscopes with special lenses, of course, are able to look at small objects and allow, for example, us to see living cells or even bacteria. But it's still not enough, for example, to see viruses. The same for SARS-CoV-2. And how to get around this problem? And is it even possible to bypass it? It turns out that yeah, and there are two ways to do this. The first way, which we'll tell you about, is an invention for which, quite recently, in 2014, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded. This is a so-called STED, or Stimulated Emission Depletion Microscopy. It's this that allows you to overcome the diffraction limit of the optical microscope. True, the technology has limitations. Not all materials can be viewed with it. But it allowed us to see various complex proteins and other organic compounds. That's because it is necessary to look at materials that can pass into a special state under the influence of a laser radiation. That is, a state when they begin to emit light. How does it work? Two lasers are used, one of which is called an exciting laser, and the second, specially selected according to the wavelength parameters, is called a cooling laser. This cooling laser compensates for the excitation perimeter of the first laser, 
and as a result of the combination of these waves, a very small area is created that begins to glow. It is now possible to distinguish objects to about 30 nanometers, which already allows you to see viruses, for example, and this is almost seven times less than with a conventional microscope. It's like looking at a soccer ball on the moon from Earth. Wow, that's a pretty cool way to trick physics. Well, now we have figured out the first way to overcome the physical barrier of optical microscopy. But what's the second way? And what should we do if we want to see inorganic substances or something less than 30 nanometers? Here we come back to our formula, which tells us that the maximum resolution is half the length of the electromagnetic wave. And scientists thought, why use the visible spectrum when you can take something with a very short wavelength? So, they went to check out what's there, in the short wave spectrum. In general, they decided not to be petty and use a bundle of electrons. The wavelength of electrons accelerated in an electric field is approximately 0.4 angstroms or 0.04 nanometers. That's 10 times less than what visible light has. By the way, if you didn't know, the size of a hydrogen atom is just about one angstrom. So, let's find out what's so cool about electron microscopes. The concept itself and the prototype was presented, you won't believe it, back in 1932 in Germany. It looked like this. In general, the overall design and function has remained pretty much unchanged since then. Although, of course, its use has become much more user-friendly. But we're not interested in when it was invented, but how it actually works. If you watched our cool video about the magic of creating processors, then you remember we told you that a focused beam of electrons is used to vaporize material and the source of these electrons is a tungsten filament. In an electron microscope, everything is roughly the same, and often, tungsten is also used as a source of electrons. The thin thread heats up to high temperatures. It begins to emit electrons in large quantities, and then the fun begins. These electrons need to be accelerated and focused. Yes, focused exactly the way you focus light in your lens or a conventional optical microscope. Only in this lens, it won't be possible to use glass lenses, because the entire electron beam will be absorbed by the first lens. To do this, you need to use electrostatic lenses. In fact, these are specially shaped electrodes that create a certain electromagnetic field. This makes it possible to focus the beam of electrons as well as accelerate them to high energies. And then this beam hits the surface of the required sample for research. Just like the light hitting the surface of the material in an optical microscope, the electron beam gives us information and allows us to actually see the sample of the study. It is worth saying here that there are two types of electron microscopes that are very different. The first is the so-called scanning electron microscope, or simply SEM. In it, a focused beam of electrons hits the surface of a sample of almost any size, and the magic of physics happens, and behind which some electrons knock out other electrons from the atoms of the material we are looking at. These new electrons are called secondary. They have relatively small energies, which allows a special detector to easily detect them. The appearance of these secondary electrons occurs very locally, and this makes it possible to increase the accuracy of image acquisition. Then, the focus beam begins to scan the surface of the material, and depending on the surface relief, a different number of secondary electrons enter the detector. That's how the picture turns out. That's why all images from an electron microscope are black and white. That is, in fact, it's just a different intensity in different parts of the image. And any color images from an electron microscope are just colored pictures. These are the most commonly used microscopes in the production of processes, as they allow you to quickly look at the quality of the surface. And in general, they are used for control at every stage of manufacturing. Before we look at the droider through a microscope, we need to tell you about another indispensable tool in the hands of scientists and engineers. A transmission electron microscope, or TEM. This is a huge pipe occupying one or even two rooms worth about a million dollars. But it's not just the price tag that's really interesting. It's clear that this equipment's very expensive. It's interesting that special rooms are built to work with it with huge concrete pillows that go many meters underground. They are needed in order to eliminate any vibrations and disturbances. That's how sensitive this equipment is. And if it weren't for these pillows, then any image would become blurred if someone at the other end of the building slammed a door. The difference from SEM 
is that it has a much higher resolution. This is due to the peculiarity of the sample itself and the electron beam. If SEM registers new electrons that flew out of the sample under the influence of an electron beam, then in TEM, we observe the original electron beam change as it gets through the sample. The essence, or idea, is that electrons flying through the sample and interacting with atoms of the material change, and after they get into the detector which tells us exactly how the original beam changed. If you listen carefully to our explanation, then surely you have a question. How is it? If electrons scatter passing through an object, then we won't see anything. Well, you'd be absolutely right, because samples need to be specially prepared for TEM. They should be very thin, up to 100 nanometers. In general, the thinner the better, ideally only 10 to 20 nanometers. For this purpose, complex methods of sample preparation are used. For example, a special ion beam, which, like a thin laser, cuts out a small piece of the sample, which then will be examined in the microscope. This allows scientists to see even individual atoms with the help of TEM. Look, every dot here is a palladium atom. It's even visible how smooth the crystal lattice of the material is. Pay attention to the scale in the lower left corner. Just one nanometer, and we can already see that now. Amazing! Now that we figured out how an electron microscope works, it's time for an experiment. Let's look at the inscription Droider through a real electron microscope, or rather, SEM. Special thanks to Glub for this. The inscription was laser cut on a thin sheet of stainless steel. Moreover, we have made a lot of inscriptions, from a large one to an inscription of just several micrometers in size. Here, you see the loading of this plate into the microscope. And it's time for you to like this unique analysis. Subscribe to the channel, and be sure to tell your friends so that we understand that we are not doing this for nothing. The plate is already in the microscope. By the way, in all these pictures, pay attention to the scale and the numbers at the MAC parameter. That is, zoom in and pause the video to get a better look. And now you can already see that inscription Droider with a magnification of 55x. So, we're going down to the smaller inscription now. Hmm, interesting. I wonder how thick the letter I is in this inscription. Let's take a closer look. Only 100 micrometers, slightly thicker than a human hair. Okay, but there are even smaller inscriptions. We go even lower and look more closely. Here, it's already clear that the magnification is 200x, but the inscription is barely distinguishable. But this is not the problem of the microscope, but of the laser with which the inscription was made. It just can't make such a small inscription. As you can see here, the letter I is already 40 micrometers. But since we are stuck with the limitation of the laser, let's go back to the largest inscription and look at the structure of the steel. So, here is the largest I, half a millimeter in thickness. We are approaching the lower edge of the letter. The magnification is already 1,500x. It's time to look at how thick the trace from the laser is. Only 40 micrometers. Even closer, and now we've increased it to 6,300x. That's the answer to our question at the beginning of the video. This is the structure of processed and untreated steel. Well, now the most interesting thing. Let's see what we can see if we zoom in to 40,000. We are already in nanometers. Look. This is the steel that the laser beam went through when it cut the letter I in the word. But it's also interesting to see how the steel looked before processing. Well, let's take a side-by-side -side look with the same magnification. The difference is just huge. And finally, let's look at the processed steel with a huge magnification of 300,000x. The width of this channel from the laser is only 300 nanometers. Well, today we learned about the electron microscope. It's simply an irreplaceable tool in the hands of scientists and engineers. And it allows you to not only see something small, but also the very structure of the matter, down to the atoms. And not only the structure, you can even determine the chemical composition of the material. This is all very useful when, for example, engineers in the production of microprocessors or screens are trying to understand where and what kind of material they have deposited, what their transistors look like, whether there are many defects, and in general, to identify a defect. Of course, we have mentioned almost nothing about how samples are prepared for study, and for example, about how all these microscopes work in a deep vacuum, for which a special pump is used, which rotates at a speed of 50,000 revolutions per minute. But remember that this video appeared only thanks to you, because the video about creation of processors got the cherished 25,000 likes, and for that special thanks goes out to all of you for this. Do you want to continue? Let's collect 25,000 likes from this video and we will tell you how a vacuum is created and why it is so important in modern technologies.
And in general, don't hesitate to write in the comments what topics you would be interested in figuring out. This is Droider. See you in the future.